One reason games work for us is that they take some portion of the world, either it's someone's imagination or some actual thing, and they abstract out certain elements, certain things that kind of get in the way um, in order that we might focus on whatever the particular thing is that the game is about. Doing so allows us to, to not have to exist fully in the world and deal with all those compli complications and instead focus on particular aspects. This can bring a sort of pleasure. Most games do this by focusing purely on uh, the one particular aspect that the game is about and kind of uh, pushes so we don't think about the sides, the edges so much except in terms of optimizing play. And so with the game we're able to focus on just this one particular subject uh, and derive pleasure from that and that's how most games work. Not so with battle stations. Which is not to say that the focus of battle stations, piloting a ship and going on missions with your comrades uh, isn't well explored or enjoyable, just that the most interesting thing about the game is how it treats the edges rather than the focus. It does this in two main ways, one relating to time and the other relating to space. In its heart of hearts, Battle Stations is a cooperative game, a moderated cooperative game where all the players are working towards a common goal based on the mission and another player is gracious enough to kind of run all the other things in the game for them so that they can enjoy that experience. One common problem with cooperative games people have is that it just becomes a, a sort of a puzzle exercise done as a group but one person might dominate. There's no um, conflicting interest that makes it uh, more akin to the world we live in or to how people actually behave. They don't think about their individual unit uh, if they're able to get past that identification with the, the player marker. And so they're, less, they're more likely to self-sacrifice, they're more likely to do things that in, a, in, other, in, a, in a different situation they might not do. Battle Stations gets around this by uh, providing characters with a, a character sheet that allows them to grow and change and acquire more equipment and abilities uh, through subsequent plays. So there's more of a, an incentive to act selfishly in some situations because you don't necessarily want your character to die even though their clone will replace them they generally gain less through death than they do through life. Because it borrows this from the role-playing world, the, the traditional role-playing world, people oftentimes uh, confuse battle stations with the role-playing game. I would say it's definitely a board game still. Uh, all of the stats and everything really just have to do with the player's uh, movement on, on the map and through the scenarios and all of the time that is spent in between missions is pretty much abstracted into a couple of die rolls. So it's not really... Uh, there's, you're not really living that character except in those moments when they are in action. And that action takes place on the boards. There's two boards in this game and that's the second way that Battle Stations explores boundaries. So we have the inside of two ships here and then we have the ships themselves on the outside. This, is a, this would be a very basic scenario where um, it's just two ships fighting. One ship would be controlled by the moderator, the other by the players. And so what's interesting about this is the way the in, what happens inside the ship interacts with what happens outside the ship and vice versa. Players are going to take on one of four basic roles, pilot, science, scientist, marine, and engineer. Pilot's going to steer the ship and every time they steer the ship it's going to make everything harder within the ship because the ship is going to go more and more out of control. That's one interesting way in which um, the, the ship's actions actually affect everyone on board. Um, the Marine is going to be firing guns and maybe invading the other spaceship through um, uh, invasion missiles. Uh, the scientist gets to deal with shields and if the scenario has to do with um, some sort of unknown thing, it's not all about combat, um, the scientist is going to be scanning that and also doing targeting locks on the other ship. And then the engineer is just going to be adjusting the power levels and, make, and pumping the engines for more power. Assuming this is your ship, ultimately how well it does in whatever mission your crew is on is going to relate to what happens within the ship, which uh, ultimately comes down to what happens within the person. So 
say this is Lieutenant Cowbot here, which it isn't. Lieutenant Cowbot is a robot and this is a human, but I just set it up with these people in mind. Um, you would roll your, and you wanted to do some piloting maneuver, you would roll your pilot, you would roll two dice, which is how you do all skill checks, get a seven, you could add your piloting, and then compare that to the difficulty. Generally with piloting, how, how fast the ship is going is how difficult it is. Um, special thing, since Lieutenant Cowbot is a pilot, he could re-roll this die if he wanted, and then make a much better roll and you, you get to do that once per time if you are of the class of the skill that you are doing. So there's, four, there's five basic attributes and four basic classes. Uh, each class is tied to a skill. They get re-rolls for that skill. So if he does well, then the ship does well on the inside, and then on the outside, the ship also does well. Um, there are, there's also ways that the ship itself can contribute. So the ship is customizable. You can get new modules for it and adjust the modules and switch them around based on uh, different racial templates. And then um, you can also upgrade different modules so that, say, if you upgraded this module here, any role you did using this module, this helm, which is steering the ship, would be better. So there's this interesting interplay between the three kind of basic components from smaller to medium size to larger. And then the larger is going to influence the medium size and the smaller by a number of ways. So there could be things in space that you run into or people are going to shoot you. And when someone shoots you, that's going to damage uh, the ship. And if you happen to be in a space where the ship gets damaged, say a shot gets fired across here, pew, pew, pew. Um, then Cowbot's going to get damaged, and then, say this is Merker, Merker also gets damaged. And the ship goes further out of control, which adds a penalty to your skill rolls, thus bringing it back around home to here, as well as whatever hit point uh, damage they get. The mythos for the game, while seemingly designed around the game play, the board game aspect, uh, is still interesting. The aliens, for example, are truly alien. They're, um, this is these uh, ergivores, they sap energy, humans, of course, rock, a pile of rocks, um, a, a pile of tentacles, this floating kind of jack thing, and then a bug man are the basic races that come with the basic game. Um, the game is well supported in that, you know, if you want to take it further, there's lots lots of ways you can expand it. Um, the expansions generally don't, they're not going to come in like a boxed production thing like this basic set, um, which has quite a bit, and you could play that for a long time. Um, they, they, there's, right now, as of this recording, there's four uh, kind of big books that are released that kind of create a whole nother spin on the game. And then there's several smaller books that are more just a, a campaign that you can play. Um, of the four big ones, there's one that is kind of more military focused. There's one that's more about exploration and science and mystery solving. Um, there's one where you're pirates, which I haven't, pl I haven't played that one, so I can't speak to that. And then there's a really interesting one, I think, uh, How Much for Your Planet, which is the newest one. I actually have that loaned out. I was hoping to show that as a visual aid right now, but I can't. Um, that one actually features a map of the whole Battle Stations universe. So if you, it allows you to move around. It also has a lot more uh, detail about the different locations and there's more races that you can play. Although there can be potentially a lot you can do with Battle Stations depending on what you want to add. There's lots of options uh, that you can choose from. You don't have to. It can be very simple to play. You basically need just one person who knows what they're doing and it's not that hard to figure out what you're doing because the game isn't that difficult. It's the sort of game I could see people playing with a committed group, an appointment type game, a, a lifestyle type game that you would play again and again uh, because there's lots of scenarios you can do. You can make up your own. You can create a history for yourself. Even though it's not totally a role-playing game, the game does continue between games. At the same time, there's an interesting world to explore. Um, especially if you if you get that expansion I talked about how much for your planet um, and you, you know a, a creative uh, moderator uh, could certainly bring in bring in more stuff of their own and a story can develop and at, 
Even at the same time as that, there's some, uh, just as a pure board game, there's some interesting interplay going on there between uh, exterior, interior, and then the, the supreme interior of the self that, uh, that really, I think, um, if any of that interests you, if, if space combat interests you, if space stuff interests you, I think you would be interested in, and it's a great value, Battle Stations! <laughs>